Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Melissa Dinwiddie. She's a creativity instigator, a podcaster, an artist, and a speaker now. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Thanks for having me, Seishu. It's great to be here. I know it was a very short introduction, but you do a whole lot more. Your website is full of great information for creative people like photographers. And we met at uh, an event a few months ago, essentially where we were learning to speak in public. And one of the things I took away from our short conversation at that event was how much you were interested in reintroducing the sense of play in, 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 the, in the lives of artists. And that really took me by surprise because no one else really I know speaks of that. So let's begin really by really driving right to that point. Why play? Why is it so important for you? Why is it so important for photographers, which is my happens to be my audience? Why should it be so important for them? Oh, my God. Okay. Well, the reason that I'm so passionate about this is that although I've never been a professional photographer, I was for many years a professional artist. I made my living as a ketubah artist primarily. A ketubah is a Jewish marriage contract, and it's the traditional part of every Jewish wedding ceremony. And I started out as a calligrapher, built up this little hobby business as a calligrapher, which grew over time and then I got divorced and I needed to make it pay, right? Really pay. So I built up this business that I still have called Ketuba Works. My website there is ketubaworks.com. And um, so I was, it was this niche market that I was serving brides and grooms, mostly Jewish or interfaith. Although I also did uh, Quaker wedding certificates and other, other kinds of documents too. Spent about mm, a decade or so building up this business. But in the process of it, Everything revolved around how do I make money from this? I got to please my clients. I got to do something to their specifications so that they're happy and they pay me. Everything was around pleasing somebody else and about making sure I had the money to pay the rent. Now, that's really important. But what I didn't realize at the time is that when you do that to the exclusion of everything else related to your craft, when you're not playing anymore, when you're no longer feeding the part of you that gets started with this thing in the first place, right? That's why you got started because it fed you in some way. When you're not feeding that creative hunger, purely playing, making messes in the creative sandbox is how I would describe it, you, you become starved. And it's a very fast route to burnout. So it's, it's essential for creative pros who are making their living from their creative thing to make sure that you are making time, dedicated time regularly to play, even if that means 15 minutes a day. It's essential. Otherwise you will, you will burn out. I guarantee it. Well, as you correctly point out, it allows you to play, make perhaps mistakes. And it reminds me of something that a national geographic photographer once said uh, in one of his books, uh, this is Bill Allard, who said, make mistakes, make creative mistakes, you know, and that way, that's really the only way to grow in the business and grow in the in the art, actually, more than anything else. Uh, and then eventually your business gets better and better because you're making things that are more, in a way, unique to, uh, you know, you and your, your clients. And so they appreciate that. Um, where, you're based. Um, tell us where you're based and, and who your audience is mostly. Well, I'm based in Silicon Valley in the San Francisco Bay Area. I actually live seven minutes from Google headquarters. So we see the self-driving cars driving around every day. Really, yeah, it's, it's a crazy place to live. Um, but I, my audience is all over the world. I do most of my work these days is actually online. Although with the speaking and um, I used to do a lot of teaching, in-person teaching. I tour- traveled around the country teaching calligraphy and book arts. And I really miss the getting together with people in 3D. So I'm looking to expand that part of my business as well. But most of what I do right now is online at my website, melissadinwitty.com. Or an easier way to find my website is to go to livingacreativelife.com because that's easier to spell <laughs> and easier to remember. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, indeed. Uh, let's talk about your, your podcast. I know you've been very busy 
uh, having launched it, and you've got lots and lots of wonderful guests on the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about the podcast. It's called Live Creative Now, which is again another rather action-oriented uh, title for for your for your for your podcast. What is it that you are trying to do with your podcast, and who is your audience there? Yeah, so the audience for the podcast is, I, I say at the intro of every of every episode, whether you are think of yourself as not creative. Think of yourself as, oh, I'm not artistic, I'm not an artist, I'm not creative. Or you think of yourself as an artist, whatever kind of artist, or anything in between, this podcast is for you. Um, because the thing is that no matter how you define yourself, not creative, or I'm an artist, whatever, wherever you are on the spectrum, mm -hmm. the reality is that feeding your creative hungers makes you feel more alive. And the other thing that people don't understand, which I am on a mission to really get out into the world, is that feeding your creative hungers is also how you change the world. It is a world-changing act. When you play with your creative thing, when you play and experiment and make messes, that is actually a world-changing act. That's the subject of one of my keynotes, actually. And there, and there are scientific reasons. It's not just fluffy, fluffy reasons for why it is world-changing. So, yeah, I mean, I could dig into that if you, if you want to spend do. time. Please I, do. I'm, I'm definitely more curious about that uh, because, I mean, I think this is what inspired me to even contact you after our, our conversation in New York several months ago uh, because I kept thinking back as to, you know, what, why is it that, photographers uh, feel, as you said, burned out after a while because you know, they keep making the same images again and again or it might be the same event that they go to <laughs> again and again. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why you know people burn out and they stop making the art that made them feel alive in the first place, which is kind of right. ironic. Um, so t go, please dig in, please dig in. Yeah. So, well, the first way that it's world changing is that think about it. When you do the thing that you love, it makes you feel more alive, right? It makes you happier. It changes your mood. It changes your state, right? So now when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the post office, when you go to, you know, meet with your boss or whatever, you are in a better mental state. You're in a better emotional state. You are better able to deal with whatever happens, right? Something negative happens. If you were in a crappy mood, boy, that interaction at the grocery store might have turned into a hissy fit, right? Absolutely. But since you're in a good mood, that interaction at the grocery store just like washes off your back, right? So that's, that's a world-changing thing. It doesn't feel like an enormous thing, but it ripples, right? One of the other ways that feeding your creative hungers is world-changing, I love, this is maybe my favorite one. This comes from the world of neuroscience, it turns out that willpower and self-control, which is, you know, allowing you to focus on your work, allowing you to have patience, allowing you to be tolerant if somebody, you know, yells at you or whatever, whenever you are restraining your behavior in some way, that's willpower, that's self-control. And that actually resides in the brain, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. I think it's the left side of the prefrontal cortex is I will power. That's like, keeps you going even though you want to go get a snack or something. And the right side of your brain, I could have these reversed. I think the right side is I won't power, which is I'm not going to eat the donut because I have a goal of being healthy and fit. And I know that all that sugar is not going to be good for me. Right. So you got, I will power, I won't power. And then right in the middle here is I want power. And that is, this is where your brain uh, is able to hold on to your long-term goals and remember your long-term goals so that you're not just acting on impulse, you're doing the thing that you want for the long-term, right? Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because this part of your brain, whenever you use your willpower, you have to make a decision on what you're going to wear in the morning. Your wife snaps at you and you decide to you know, play it cool and you, even though you want to snap back, right? Whatever. Every time you use your willpower, you're fatiguing this. It's kind of like a muscle, a metaphorical muscle, right? So when this metaphorical muscle of your willpower gets fatigued, this part of the brain really stops working optimally, so if you know if you if you also if you don't get enough sleep, if you don't have a good diet, if you don't get exercise, this part of your brain doesn't optimally 
work. And so you're not able to have the same kind of self-control and, and willpower as you might, right? Wow, For any any willpower challenge. Sure. Now where where it, the creative play fits in here is that scientists have studied how do you restore energy to your brain when it's depleted? How do you restore that willpower metaphorical muscle after it's been drained? And in one study, they divided uh, the the subjects into three different groups. And f- all three groups were given a some kind of a challenge, a, a task that would t- that would use willpower for them to do, like solving a puzzle or something like that. And then there was an intermi- intermediate condition. And there were three different conditions that people had. And then they gave them another willpower task. So what they wanted to look at was, which of these intermediate conditions would uh, enable them to keep sticking with the task the longest when they got to the third state of being given another willpower draining task. And what they discovered was the thing that restored energy to the brain the most effectively was doing something that engaged people's interest. So anything that is going to really captivate you, really engage your interest, that restores energy to your brain. So it could be, you know, it could be mountain biking, it could be rock climbing. And guess what? It could be doing your photography. It could be painting. It could be, you know, playing your guitar and singing. Whatever it is that is going to engage your interest is going to feed your brain, restore energy to your brain so that you then have the willpower and the self-control to stick with, you know, stay on focus, stay on task, to um, not lash out at your boss when he snaps at you or whatever, whatever, the various different things that, that you know, willpower is required to do through the rest of your day. This is world changing because it is never self-indulgent to do something that restores your energy. And one of the things that creatives really suffer from is the belief that, oh, this thing I'm doing, it's self-indulgent. It's frivolous. It's not important, Right wrong, wrong. When you do that self-indulgent thing, it is restoring energy to your brain. And that is absolutely not self-indulgent. It is the opposite of self-indulgent. That is world changing. Wow. That's mind blowing right there. Uh, absolutely. I, I love it. I, I absolutely love that. Uh, and it's one of the reasons uh, I recently now I chose to stick with photography uh, as a way of playing uh, when I when I walk around with, uh, you know, with my kids or I go shopping, I have a camera around my neck and I'm always looking for photographs. I mean, the hunt for a photograph is always my sense of play. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way, though, right? It can be it can be anything. I mean, I, 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 I'm assuming uh, photographers who are listening to this podcast, uh, this, this, sh- this show can perhaps consider pottery or absolutely anything really i mean i just chose pottery but uh you you could be a mountain biker or you could go bowling i know a photographer who goes bowling every every week uh with his father um and it's it's one of those things that i I, you know it sounds great first of all right i mean you're hanging out with your dad and go bowling right but it's also that i'm sure it engages him in in different ways and and gives him that sense of play and it's real play uh as well when it comes to uh, boundaries, though, let's let's talk about let's talk about limits, though. I mean, because there is a certain limited amount of time per day, per week, per month. What do you suggest for photographers who are listening, who don't have or don't feel like they have a whole lot of time to play? What do you suggest to them? This is such an important question. And, you know, this is something that speaks to me personally, because the the decade where I was not producing any art for me, except once a year, I would go to a retreat with my calligraphy guild for five days. So five days during the year, I would play. And the rest of the year, no, not at all. And part of what prevented me was this belief that I needed great big chunks of time, that if I didn't have great big chunks of time, it was not worth it, right? It was it was pointless. So I would think, oh, I, I'm going to set aside an entire afternoon on Friday. That never happened. I mean, come on, you're self-employed. That's not going to happen. It certainly didn't, certainly didn't for me. It probably does for some people. What really changed for me was in, on February 1st, 2011, I interviewed an artist 
who, named Michelle Taberge, who works with, she's a professional artist and she works with artists who want to have professional gallery exhibiting fine art careers. And you would think that these people have no problem getting to their art studios. No, they have just as much resistance as anybody else. And what Michelle would say to her mentees is, if you can't put 15 minutes a day into your art, you're making an excuse. And when she said that while I was interviewing her, it was like an arrow just like straight, straight in my heart because I knew, oh my God, she, that's me. That is me. And I decided by the end of that 45 minute interview, I was going to commit Every day that month was a short month. It was February, only 28 days that year. I was going to commit to at least 15 minutes a day making art. And I really thought, what, how, much can that, how much good can that really do? But hey, it's, it's better than nothing. I might as well try it. It's not going to hurt me to try it. Right. And what I discovered totally blew my mind. First of all, I discovered that you can actually get into a state of flow in, a lo- in 15 minutes like a much sooner than I thought. So you can get into that delicious place, you know, where you you lost track of time, you're lost track of your ego and you're just doing the thing. Right. It doesn't take very long to get there. And the other thing that really blew my mind is that when I was putting in, even if it really was only 15 minutes Mm -hmm. for say the whole week long, it was only 15 minutes every day, set a timer and I had to stop at the end of that time. It, was amazing how much it kept my toe in the creative stream. Way better than if I had taken all day Saturday. Because all week long, I'm in touch with my art. I'm thinking about it. I'm immersed in it, even though it's just a tiny little bit every day. Do I want more? Of course I do. Of course I do. I want to be able to make art all day long. But that's not reality for most days in my life, right? So I make do with what I can. And I put the art making into, I call it the nooks and crannies of my life, with the caveat that the thing you do first is the thing that gets done. So if you want to make sure that you get create time, I I would call it creative sandbox time into your day, do it first thing. Because if you wait and try to fit it in when you can find the time, it's not going to happen. So that is my suggestion. If you can't, if you really can't take 15 minutes a day, you're making an excuse. And if you still really can't fit in 15 minutes, make it 10 minutes, make it five minutes. Make it something teeny tiny because really the bit the biggest problem is starting. There's so much starting friction. Yes, that there is, isn't there? It's crazy. So if you can eliminate the starting friction and make it ridiculously achievable, stupidly small, just to get yourself to start, game over. That's all you need. I'm uh I'm sort of looking away for a quick second because I just downloaded an app. I don't know if that makes a, a, a big difference at all, but it's it's an app that was suggested by uh, a guy named Michael Hyatt. And I link to it. Um, I just downloaded it and I can't find it now, right now. <laughs> but it is it is one that allows people to keep track of things that they are supposed to do every day or not oh, supposed I, to do. Oh, I have I one know, of those. Do you have one of those apps? Yeah, there's so many of them out there. Yeah, and I use, um, yeah. let me, I can tell you which one it is that I use. I think one is called Streak, right? Um, the one that I have on my phone is Habit Master. Habit I Master. think okay. I think it's free. Okay. And I have a number of things that I check off every night that, you know, I aim to do every day. And sure. then I actually keep track. Right. So that might be a, an option as well for those of us who are, uh, you know, comfortable t- with technology and want to, want to stay away from simple pencil and paper <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, it, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure talking to you melissa because you know i think this is the kind of conversation that i i hope we can have on tiffin box with other creatives like yourselves uh because everyone has their own approach to uh making art making a living uh, as an artist as well and i feel photographers are artists i mean uh, you know they may not be uh, photographers who show their work in a museum or have gallery openings or, or whatever, but whatever they do at home uh, for their own clients locally is art. And one of the things that I, I 
struggle with my my own art is making the time and you've given us great ideas on how to structure our day how to start off our day uh, by just saying hey 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes even of just you know essentially it's me time but me and my art time you know and we go at it and create something on a on a regular basis so it becomes a habit right you want Absolutely. it to become a habit uh, exactly. And, and that way you're you're not feeling burnt out. You're not feeling stressed out about all the other things that need to be done as well. Uh, there's a part of you that feels energized and alive uh, every single day. And what better way to serve uh, humanity than being just being in the humanity, right? Being part of Absolutely. Humanity, so. And remember, it's brain feeding time. Brain feeding it's... time. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that might be by the, the title of the post. How to feed your brain every day, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Well, thank you again for, for joining me today, Melissa. I'm, uh, I'm so glad we've connected and I will be watching uh, for everything that you're doing and will uh, also link to your podcast. I want people to go listen to you, listen to more of you for sure, uh, because I think this is great, great stuff. You know, so cool. thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.